Okay, so in chapters 10 and 11, last time, the narrators, the ones who are kind of writing uh, the information, they, uh, they traced the genealogy of the nations from Noah's sons all the way down several generations. And we looked at possible national origins derived from the names of these people and the names found in early civilizations. That's how, if you're wondering, how do they, you know, how do they hook up? You know, well, similar names similar names of early, early uh, peoples, you know, similar language and references can be brought back to one of the three uh, individuals here. But the Bible was very specific in the idea that all civilizations uh, can trace their source to Japheth, Ham, and Shem. Japheth, uh, we said at the time, uh, the peoples of, of Europe, the India, the Middle East, Ham, uh, the peoples of Africa, the Middle East, the Orient, uh, north, the native peoples of the North and South America, Shem, the Middle East, especially the Jews, the Shem, the Shemites, the Semites, okay. The key idea, of course, as I've mentioned, was that all civilizations originally descend from these three, and God puts this in the Bible to give us that, that information. The next factor that had a profound significance on society were the events surrounding the Tower of Babel. And you know, there's, people say it so many different ways, Tower of Babel, 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 you know, there's a million ways to say it, but I've looked at the phonetics of it, you know, and uh, the phonetics say the pronunciation should be B-A-W-B-E-L, so Babel, Babel. Makes no difference, we know what it means. Um, God tells the people, of course, to fill the earth at this time, uh, but man does exactly the opposite. He concentrates in one place, falls into a form of paganism. God separates them by multiplying the languages. It was, uh, instead of starting a civil war, he just confuses the languages so that they can't talk to each other and understand each other, and so they begin to form similar groups that have similar languages and begin to drift away. This multiplication of languages set into motion the physical and geographic changes that resulted in different cultures, different physiologies, and different countries that we have today. It's not like we have a million different countries, right? There's only about 150 different nations, even going back to that time. So we then see two other writers pick up the story from Shem who was the one who was writing the record that includes the Tower of Babel, that incident. So you remember I told you that the patriarchs, their sons, they're the ones that are recording this stuff, okay? Ultimately, Moses, we spoke about this at the very beginning of Genesis, but for those of you who weren't there, ultimately what Moses does is he gathers these records and puts them together to create the book of Genesis. We know Moses is the one who recorded it, who actually you know, put it down into writing. Uh, but he wasn't there at the beginning of the world, obviously, he wasn't there at that time. So he's working from oral tradition, written tradition, so on and so forth. We talked about this at the beginning of Genesis. So that's why I am mentioning, this is the record of Terah, this is the record of Shem, you know, different ones picked up the story and kept writing it or moved the oral tradition forward, okay? So now Terah, a descendant of Shem, we've got the three, you know, uh, 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 Japheth, Ham, Shem. Okay, so now Shem, we're going to zero in on Shem and one of his descendants is Terah, a descendant of Shem. He provides a very short record that includes the genealogy from Shem to himself and then down to Abram, who was later to become Abraham. So the story now shifts from a wide view of society and the world. You know, the Bible has given us now the details of how the world began, how it and society got to be the way it is, you know, through the sin of man and you know, through the flood and now the Tower of Babel and the difference of languages. You know, we got the wide view of how things happen. Now, as I mentioned to you, the writers are going to now focus in a tight shot, a very 
up close and personal shot of just one person. Okay. It will now remain in this close-up mode until the very end in order to show how God will bring onto the stage of humanity the Savior, Jesus Christ. You have the wide view, how did the world begin, why is it the way that it is, and once we've established that, it zooms into Abram. And from then on, it just follows Abram and his you know, descendants all the way to Jesus Christ. Okay? So after Terah's record, another writer, this time Isaac, will continue telling the story of Abraham. Okay? His son is telling the story. He begins by naming the three sons of Terah and a little bit of their history. Let me just change this over here. In chapter 11, 27 to 32, Haran died young, Nahor, married Haran's daughter, and then Abram married his half-sister who is uh, said, to be, said to be barren. Now we don't have any details, but Terah uh, packed up part of his family, uh, and that would include Abram and Sarai, and Lot, who was the child of his dead son Haran, and he was headed to Canaan but he only got as far as the city of Haran, which is probably a city that his dead son built. So the story of Terah ends here. He may have refused to go on, he may have been sick and died, we don't know. All we know is that his original journey was to Canaan, but he never made it. So this sets the scene for the life and the call of Abram. So let's go to chapter 12, beginning in verse one, now that we've set up the story, and let's read about the life of Abraham and the call that he received. Chapter 12, beginning in verse one. It says, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. And I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great. And so you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. So Abram went forth as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. Now Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his nephew, and all their possessions which they had accumulated, and the persons which they had acquired in Haran. And they set out for the land of Canaan, Thus they came to the land of Canaan. Abram passed through the land as far as the site of Shechem to the oak of Moreh. Now the Canaanite was then in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your descendants I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. Then he proceeded from there to the mountain on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east and there he built an altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. Abraham journeyed on, continuing toward the Negev. So Terah has died, and the Lord calls Abraham to leave Haran to finish the journey to Canaan. Let me just show the map here. Here's a little map, I want to see how, well, it doesn't look very big there, but can you, can you spot, look at the very bottom there to your right, where it says Ur, that's where Abraham or Abram originally comes from, Ur. Notice if you, if you follow that light blue line, aqua, whatever color you, you want, it's not blue, right? It's kind of aqua, kind of aqua line. So if you follow that aqua line, you see Ur and then just above that, Babylon. So you're in, you know, you know the Babylonians, the land of Ur, that's, that's Iraq, okay? So that's where he is. And then they're called, uh, Terah is called to go to Canaan. So notice, keep following the line, keep following the line, and you see Haran is the furthest northern point there at the top, Haran. So, so, so from Ur, Terah you know, gets as far as Haran, but he doesn't go any further than that. We don't know why, maybe he died there, maybe he just didn't want to go any further, but he was called to go to Canaan. 
And so what happens is that Abram and his wife, which is his half-sister, and Lot, his nephew, right? And his family and his slaves and so on and so forth, he packs them up from there and he continues the journey all the way to Canaan and even further he eventually gets to Egypt and we'll talk about that in a minute, okay? Now in Acts chapter 7 verse 2, you don't have to go there, but Stephen says that God called Abram while he lived in Ur which may mean that both Terah and Abram were called, but Terah would not go any further than Haran. Could be a lot of reasons for that. We just know he didn't make it all the way to Canaan. So the Lord calls Abram to leave Haran and the things that are keeping him there. So what could be keeping him there? Well, you know, maybe it's his country, <laughs> it's his culture. Uh, his people, his family, no such thing as Jew here at this point. Abraham is the first one. When he arrived in the land, the Canaanites, Canaanite would call him a Hebrew, which means from the other side of the river, the Euphrates. Okay? That's, that's where the term comes from. So he has to leave everything, but God makes a promise to him, actually a series of promises. First of all, he says, uh, he will give rise to a great nation. That's the first promise that he makes. Because right now, just one guy, right? From Ur, a Sumerian, not Sumerian, Sumer, you know, people from that era, a pagan, because the quote Jewish religion hasn't been, hasn't been given to them yet in that sense. Uh, the promise is that he himself will become a great man, that he will bless others with his life, that, he will, that God will protect him, this is a promise, and that the entire world through history will be blessed through Abram. Pretty big promises. You notice he doesn't say how here this is going to happen. He just said this is going to happen. Abram could never imagine you know, never imagine how these promises were going to be fulfilled. They were simply promises that God made. But I want you to keep that idea in mind. We'll come back to that near the end. So these sound like you know, great blessings. Wow, who wouldn't want to be a great man? Who wouldn't want to bless you know, history and so on and so forth? But I want you to consider Abram's state. Here's a, a guy who had completely forsaken his home, his family, his nation, and his culture in order to have a promised nation come from him, a nation he'd had no idea what, what's, what's, what's so bad about the old nation we've got, he might have said. You know, isn't this nation good enough? And he had to abandon, and I think this is even more important, he had to abandon the safety of what was familiar to him in order to go into the unknown with only the promise of God's protection, but no visible sign of it. If God had said, well look, I want you to travel to Cana, you know, and poof, there's a, you know, a bag of gold, you know, and poof, and there are 500 soldiers, well-equipped soldiers to protect you. You got the money and you got the protection. So you go ahead and run now. You, you go on down to Canaan. Don't forget, he's never been to Canaan. He doesn't know what's there. All he has is the promise. Go ahead, I'll, I'll be with you, I'll protect you. Now you have to understand the journey to Canaan was about 400 miles with his family and servants along with his livestock and provisions. 400 miles, nothing to us, right? We leave in the morning, we're there for late lunch, wherever we're going. On a nice highway, we stop for coffee, you know, it's, it's okay. 400 miles for these people was like, are you kidding me? They didn't travel 400 miles. You, you, you lived, you grew up, and you died in the same village. You didn't leave your village. So this was a tremendous, tremendous undertaking for, for him. And you, you certainly didn't leave to go to another country to another people. You might live, you know, sh he marries her, she's in that village, she goes back and lives in his village, you know, yeah, maybe. 
but to go to another country? Whoa. So in verse seven it says, the Lord appears to Abram. This is the first time that that is expressed in this way, that the Lord appeared. And it was to add one more thing to the list of promises, and that was that the land he was living in would one day be owned by his people. Of course, at that time, owning the land was like, yeah, it was everything. So for the first time, we see Abram worship the Lord in the land of Canaan. And at this point, Abram is living like a nomad. He's traveling southwards towards Egypt. All right, so let's talk about Abram in Egypt. What begins as a test of faith ends in a loss of faith and a loss of effectiveness for Abram and Sari. So let's read verse 10. It says, now there was a famine in the land. So Abraham went down to Egypt to sojourn there for the famine was severe in the land. So a famine comes up which threatens their security and their well-being. So what does Abram do? He decides to escape it by you know, going to Egypt. There's food there, I hear. Now there's one thing, I don't know if you noticed it, but there's something he didn't do here. Note that he did not consult God in the matter or make any indication that he relied on any of the promises that God said to him. Didn't God say to him, I'll protect you, I'll provide for you, I'll take care of you? And yet, when there was a famine in the land, the first thing that Abram did was say, you know what, there's food there in Egypt. Let's go to, let's go to Egypt. Remember, God said He would provide for them but when this would put to the test, Abram took matters into his own hands. And that's exactly that, what we do all the time. And I, I, I really include myself in that. In that, in that. We, we take matters into our own hands. Men worse than women, because men are, you know, quote, problem solvers. You know. I see this in counseling all the time. You know. The woman is saying, all I want for you is to listen to what I'm saying. And the guy is saying, or doing, all I want to do is solve your problem. And she's saying, the problem is, you're not listening to what I'm saying. And he's saying, yeah, yeah, I hear what you're saying, and I'm going to fix your problem. She's saying, she's saying uh, I, I don't want you to fix anything. If you want to fix something, fix the way you listen to me, so I can be sure that you're actually paying attention to what I'm saying. You know what I'm saying? So it's just, I don't want to get too far afield here. But it's the same thing here with, with Abram. God said, I'm going to take care of you. You won't have to worry. You're going to be a great man. Da, da, da. You know, everything you need, I'll take care of. Just go there. And the minute he goes there and something happens, the, the promises fly out the window. Nowhere is it mentioned that he you know, said, Lord, you said you'd take care of us. We're now running out of food. What shall we do? There's none of that that's going on. So going to Egypt you know, seems like a good idea. It was close by, prosperous. They had no home or family in Canaan to hold them back. Again, the problem was God had told him to go to Canaan, not to Egypt. Don't go to Egypt. Go to Canaan. And God had promised, as I said, to care for them. And that didn't change even if there was a famine. And Egypt, of course, was a pagan and immoral place that had food, but there was also a lot of temptation there. A lot of temptation. Verse 11 to 13, it says, It came about when he came near to Egypt that he said to Sarai, his wife, See now, I know that you are a beautiful woman, and when the Egyptians see you, they will say, This is his wife, and they will kill me, but they will let you live. Please say that you are my sister, so that it may go well with me because of you and that I may live on account of you. Now in those days, a foreigner had no rights, much different than it is today, of course. And a, a beautiful woman, especially a beautiful foreign woman, was actually a profitable commodity. A beautiful foreign woman unattached, you could take her and you could sell her. Okay? So once in Egypt, they saw that there was danger of you know, being killed or enslaved. 
And for this reason, they concocted a plan whereby they said that you know, they were brother and sister, which was, well, it was partly true. She was his half-sister, okay? But you know what they say, a half-truth is a whole lie. Yeah, right. So if someone wanted to take her, they would then have to negotiate with Abram. That was the point. If, if it's the husband, you can't take her without getting rid of him. You can't negotiate for his wife. But if it's the brother, the brother has the right of negotiation. You know? So they also forgot God's other promise, and that was to protect them from harm. So let's keep reading this story. I know it's very familiar. We've read it before. But it says, it came about when Abram came into Egypt, the Egyptians saw that the woman was very beautiful. Pharaoh's officials saw her and praised her to Pharaoh and the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. Therefore he treated Abram well for her sake, and gave him sheep and oxen and donkeys and male and female servants and female donkeys and, and camels. So not only was Sarah noticed, she was noticed by the princes who served the Pharaoh. They praised her, the Hebrew word halal there, was used for praise in, in, in worship, actually. The, 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 the Hallel Psalms, for example, the, the, the group of psalms that Jesus and the apostles sang in the upper room at the Last Supper, they're called the Hallel Psalms. Well, that word Hallel, this is the first time it's used here in the Bible to describe Sarah, to praise her, okay? It seems that her beauty and her character were worthy of such praise that she wasn't raped, she wasn't taken as a slave, but the Pharaoh took her into his harem in order to prepare her for marriage. So just taking her into the harem didn't mean that there was intimacy at this point, it simply meant he was going to groom her to become one of his wives. So the plan is working well. You know, a lot of people are blaming Abram here, but you don't hear Sarai speaking up. You don't hear her saying, hey, wait a minute, I thought God promised us all these things. What's the matter with you? Why should we do this? We shouldn't do, you know, nothing. This is a plan that they concocted together. They were in it together. So they, you know, the, they figured the plan's really working well. They avoided the famine, they avoided attack, and they're getting wealthy at the hand of the king. Are you kidding me? We got power, we got the inn, we're, we're connected in this place, nobody's bothering us. Okay, this little thing of maybe you're in the king's harem, okay, maybe. <laughs> but this plan was also causing some problems. They were losing each other, of course. But as far as our story is concerned, they were jeopardizing the seed of promise, because the seed of promise was supposed to go through Abraham. And so now they're jeopardizing that, that Sarai would bear a child from the king of, or the king of Egypt, the Pharaoh of Egypt, would have spoiled that particular plan. And they were also forfeiting all the promises of God. So it was a long-term loss for a short-term gain. Again, I keep repeating all the time, human nature has not changed in three, four, five thousand years. We, as human beings, we continue to make short-term decisions not looking at the long-term long -term consequences. So verse 17, it says, but the Lord struck Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. Then Pharaoh called Abraham and said, what is this you have done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister so that I took her for my wife? Now then, here is your wife, take her and go. Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him, and they escorted him away with his wife and all that had belonged to him. So at this point, God intervenes. Now we don't know what or for how long, but Pharaoh's family and household begins to suffer plagues. And in some way he is made to understand that the cause of it is Sarai and that she is Abraham's wife, maybe she herself, you know, told one of the other wives, and you know, you know how news travels. He's also made to understand that these people are protected by God, otherwise, let's face it, he would have killed them both. What does he care? Life is cheap, you know. Life is cheap. Or he would have killed uh, Abram and kept 
Sarai and sold her as a slave. So we see instead that Pharaoh does the opposite. He gives a sharp rebuke to Abram, and in the rebuke the king reproaches him not only for his deception, but for his lack of faith. I want to tell you something. It's one thing to be rebuked by a brother in Christ, or an elder, or a minister, you know, to call you out on your stuff, on your hypocrisy, or blah, 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 from the pulpit, or whatever it is. But it's quite another thing for somebody who's not a member of the church to call you out on your poor Christianity. I mean, that's got to be the most embarrassing thing. And you know, when somebody says, and you call yourself a Christian? Now, sometimes it's not fair, right? People who are not people of faith, oh, they know how we ought to live. You know, they're always you know, judging how we do this. So I, I thought you were a Christian, you know, and it's rather unfair. But imagine when it is fair, like when we do something that really is not right or not good, and we get called on it by somebody who is not a Christian, but at least knows how Christian ought to act. It's exactly what's happening here, exactly what's taking, taking place uh, here. So he's upset the king that he might have been fooled into taking another man's wife and then suffering the wrath of God. At least the king you know, understands you're not to take another man's wife. And that's it, even in the pagan world, uh, there were principles. And also that Abraham, a man that he blessed and seemed to admire, he gave him gifts and so on and so forth, would do this to him. How could you do this to me? You know? And then of course, he at least, believes enough in the God of Abram to spare him and send him his way. So somehow there must have been some faith on the Pharaoh's part to recognize that you know, Abram is protected by a mighty God. Obviously, if this God has given us plagues, you know, he has power. So he rebukes Abram, and the rebuke is especially harsh because at this point he believes God more than Abraham does because he has obeyed God in sparing these people. So the, the Pharaoh is like a better <laughs> example of someone who has faith than Abram at this point. And so God spares Abram's, Abram's life. In the end, he doesn't take her as his wife. He allows Abram to keep all of his wealth and he assures them the protection that they need to have in order to leave the country. You know, we'll escort you out, all right? All right, we'll stop the passage there and I want to kind of do a couple of lessons that we can draw from, from this here. Abram's early experiences in his walk with God provide some important lessons for us even today. Remember I told you 5,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago, people never changed. So here's uh, one lesson. It's about faith and not famine. Now you can change that word famine to something else there. You can change it to your sore back. You can change it to I can't find a job. You can change it to I'm ill. You can change it to my children are giving me trouble. You can change it to, you know what I'm saying? Fill in the blank. Just fill in the blank with your thing, whatever your thing is. It's about faith, not about famine. We see the small picture, see, God sees the big picture, obviously. Abraham, all he saw, Abram, all he saw was food as the problem, and he compromised himself because of it. God used the famine as a way of testing Abraham's faith. Ultimately, Abram would be a model for faith. Imagine, he's the father of faith. So his first test of faith, he fails miserably. But the thing we need to remember is this was a test of faith, not a test of how to survive a famine. And so the famine served God's purpose in testing faith, not Abram's resourcefulness in finding food. That wasn't what it was about. For every believer since Abram until today and un until Jesus' return, it's always about faith, not famine or whatever else we want to put in that slot. It's exactly what I said to uh, our brother that I mentioned before, who is you know, in hospice and so on and so forth, six months roughly to live. It's exactly the words that I said to him. 
This is not about your illness. This is not about six months, eight months, 14, you know, beating the odd. This is not about that. This is about faith. This is about you holding on to the very end. Even though it's not fair, you're just getting your business going, you know what I'm saying? If you get retired, you got a nice place, you know, you'll be able to travel now, you, have a, you know what I'm saying? It's all good and then boom, this thing comes along and your, your life is gone. It's not about this thing, it's about your faith. But it's always about your faith, whether you're 14 years old or 50 years old or 75 years old, it's always about your faith. Everything that happens in your life as a Christian is about your faith. If we would have that perspective, oh boy, we'd save ourselves a lot of trouble. If we would learn to interpret the good and the bad that occurs in our lives as issues of faith, in other words, how will my faith react to this? we will probably have fewer famines and survive well the ones that we do have. That's lesson number one. It's about faith, not famine. Lesson number two, a promise is a promise. Especially when God gives the promise. The geography or the circumstances did not change God's promises to Abraham or to Abram. His problem was that he did not claim his promises through worship and prayer when the time came. Instead, he took matters into the, his own hands. Remember what I, what I said? Nowhere do we see the prayer, God, you promised to take care of us and now we're starving to death. You know, tell me what to do. Maybe then God would have said, okay, here's what you're going to do. They have food in Egypt. Go down to Egypt and get some food, but do not lie. You know what I'm saying. His problem was that he did not claim his promises. God's promises are sure, not because the circumstances favored their fulfillment, they are sure for three other reasons. They're sure because God never lies. He cannot lie. So if he says, you know, I will protect you, he cannot lie. If he says, I will raise you from the dead, he cannot lie. If he says, if you do that, I'm going to do this, he cannot lie. A promise is a promise, and his promise is sure because he cannot lie. Also, nothing is impossible with God, so he can always fulfill his promises. <laughs> Nothing's, things are impossible for us, and believe me, even simple things are impossible for us at times. But nothing's impossible for him, so he is always able to fulfill his promises because nothing holds him back. And then finally, his promise depends on him, not on us. He saved Abram even after Abram messed up. Why? Because he said so. He said, I will take care of you. He didn't say, I will take care of you if you're nice and if you're good and if you always do what I say and if you're just a, just a goody, goody person and if you're a person full of faith and you never swear and you never, you know, I'll take care of you if you do all. No, he said, I will take care of you. You know how we give the vows of matrimony, you know, through good and evil, you know, whether rich and poor, healthy or unhealthy, whatever, in all circumstances, until death do us part, you know, we make, that's the vow that we have from God. I will protect you and I will bless you and I will save you, you know, healthy or not healthy, whether you're acting 100% right or 2% right, you know, I'll, I'll be there for you. Someone says, well, I'm afraid of losing my salvation because sometimes you know, I'm down and I'm depressed and you know, I'm you know, not doing all the things I ought to do. You know. And I tell them, your salvation is not based on how strong you are. Your salvation is based on how strong God is. And so long as you trust in His strength and not yours, you're saved, my friend. It's when you start thinking about being saved based on your own strength or your own goodness, that's when you're in trouble. It's so counterintuitive, I know, but that's the gospel. The gospel is counterintuitive. 
It's like you being in a plane, you can't tell when you're upside down. You know? A lot of pilots, I've never had this experience, but a lot of pilots say you have to trust your instruments you know, because if you're just going by your eyes and so on and so forth, it feels all wrong, but you have to trust your instruments. If your instruments tell you you're upside down, then you're upside down, you got to correct. That's the same thing here. You have to trust the gospel. Don't trust your feelings. Satan is the one that manipulates feelings to, to make the righteous feel guilty or to make them afraid and so on and so forth. No, no, no. We're saved because God promised we're saved. And that promise is solid because He can do it. And then the last thing, you can't share a faith that you don't have. The Egyptians and the Pharaoh were impressed by Abram and Sarai, but after the deception was found out, they were sent out of the country. Now imagine, can you imagine, if they would have relied on God and gave their witness as God, of God's great power? I mean, they could have made the Pharaoh and his household believers in God. What could have been? As it was, an opportunity to witness to a mighty king was lost because the witnesses themselves were unfaithful. And you know, we all miss chances like that. I mean, I'm not going to harp on this point. I've, I've missed chances like that. I spoke too soon, said the wrong thing, blew a great opportunity to share my faith with somebody. I mean, if salvation were based on the fact that you took advantage of every opportunity to share your faith with someone successfully, if, if salvation were based on that, well, I, I don't know about you guys, but I wouldn't be going to heaven. <laughs> I wouldn't be going to heaven, for sure. And that's what I'm supposed to be doing for a living, imagine. But still, you know, had, had, he, had he done the right thing there, there could have been a, a fabulous reward. As it was, like I say, an opportunity was blown. We don't all come before kings, of course, but time and opportunity bring us close to a lot of people who are interested in us because they see the light of faith that's shining in us. They see that light, they want to know what's, what's different. So we need to be careful that our actions don't contradict the faith that we profess to have. You know, we say we have faith, but we have to make sure that those actions back up that particular, that particular faith. Okay, so that's lesson 27. I don't want to go further because we're going to open another chapter here and uh, uh, I'd rather just cut it short a little bit and then we can do you know, whole sections at a time.